Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my March 2022 Page 112 tag. The Page 112 tag was started by Sean at Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, it was based off of a French literary prize wherein they comprised the long list uh, for that prize solely by reading page 112 of each of the books of con in contention. These books would be novel length, so page 112 would be uh, somewhere in the middle of the novel, uh, you know, and uh, you would have no context for the rest of the story, so you would uh, be uh, basing your decision solely on the writing uh, on that page. I have been using this tag uh, since uh, the beginning of the COVID lockdowns to uh, slowly cull my physical TBR shelves. I use this handy dandy Books and Cats mug, which uh, as of right now is uh, filled with uh, titles on these pieces of paper of books I've acquired in 2021 or before. I pull out three of these titles at random each month, uh, get out the books, read page 112 with you all, and then decide which book will uh, be joining my monthly TBR. At least that's what I do most months that I play this game. Every fourth month, I decide to spice things up a little bit uh, and uh, use the three runners-up from the previous three months playing, pit them against each other, and choose from amongst those three which will be joining this month's TBR. It's a nice way also to uh, cut back on some of my post-production uh, items that I'll need to do after finishing filming, although uh, on the downside I don't get to randomly choose books and pull titles out of that little mug, which I do also like doing. <laughs> but alas, that's the way the cookie crumbles, and I am very excited for this round of page 112 tag. So without any further ado, let's go back into the past. answer straight away. Just as she thought he'd fallen asleep, he opened his eyes again. Home's what's left over when you've figured out all the places you don't want to be. His lips lifted in a brief smile. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? But that's what we do. We say, not there, and not there, and not there, until there's only one place left. He stifled another yawn. It's like triangulating something. Work out why you don't want all those other places, then follow the lines and see where they cross. His hand waved vaguely, as though drawing some diagram in the empty air. She should go. They'd both be awkward over this conversation when he woke. She moved towards the door. Get some sleep. Jamie, she turned. There's someone, he said, fixing her with a suddenly clear gaze. Someone you're looking for, isn't there? She hesitated for a long moment. Yes. Thought so. He gave her the faintest of smiles and closed his eyes. Jamie watched him for a moment before letting herself out and closing the door behind her. Back in her quarters, she climbed straight into bed. She was lead-limbed with tiredness. She should really go and check in on Myla and Lowry. He'd mentioned a heart problem. Just as she closed her eyes, her thoughts flickered back to those moments when she'd slumped next to Callan. She had an absurd urge to climb back down to go and find him and curl against his back just to be close to someone else who might be feeling a little of what she was feeling. Daniel, his name fell into her thoughts, sending ripples of shock running through her. He stared back at her, accusingly, from the shadows at the corners of her mind. You never wanted to be close to me. She rolled over, wrapping herself in the blanket. She had wanted him, but when she let him in, he seemed to fill all the space she gave him, and still want more of her, digging away at her closed-off corners, the ones clearly marked with a sign saying, no through road. Surprisingly, unsurprisingly, I enjoyed this one as well. We were lucky to begin again with a piece of clear dialogue where we were quite obviously between a conversation between these two people, Jamie and whoever the man was she was talking to. You know, there's obviously a few names that filtered through this page. Uh, but, you know, what they were talking about was just so intriguing. I think what really drew me to this book, these questions of home and belonging and looking for someone, <laughs> that uh, it just drew me in. I mean, this just obviously seems to be a very uh, serious uh, emotional conversation, even if perhaps uh, it's uh, not the best idea, given what Jamie's thinking about it. 
And there are a few lines that I think are a little too showy, not telly in this, uh, in this page, but again, I'm still very invested in ultimately getting to this story. Uh, I am very invested in characters who are searching and uh, have interior drama, and Jamie from this page certainly seems to have that. Fanny knows how country life works, knows that their strange appearance will have already become the topic of the day. It is time to disappear. They must hasten on to Baranovici before rumor of the three dead bodies reaches the village. Thanks, perhaps, to the smelling salts, the old Jew finally wakes, his black eyes widening at the sight of Zizek's scarred face looming over him. He tries to get to up to his feet or flee from the wagon, but his legs tangle like a newborn lamb's and he collapses again. However, once he has understood that the horses have been stopped for him and that he has been offered water and dry bread, he is no longer in such a rush to get up. His back aches and his muscles are feeble, but if he could only take a little bite from one of those apples that his saviors have accumulated on their travels through the village, his body would surely regain its strength. On the other hand, he has bad teeth, so perhaps they would be so kind as to peel and slice the apple for him. It doesn't take long for Fanny and Zizek to discover that this Jew is quite demanding. He tells him that his name is Schleimel and that he is a Hazan, a cantor. Fanny is surprised at, by this revelation. Hazanim are usually devout men, greatly respected by Jewish communities. What has happened to him, and why was he lying at the side of the road in a filthy kaftan? What is more, how can he understand their Polish? Hazanim usually speak only Yiddish and Hebrew. They have no use for other languages. Schleimel, the cantor, merely shrugs and offers no answer. They found him by the wayside? He is surprised. Perhaps he fell victim to sunstroke, or maybe he was robbed by bandits. Yes, yes, it's all coming back to him now. There were two of them, maybe even three, ogres, sons of giants who accosted him, demanding to know why he was roaming around the villages on foot like a government spy. And he explained to them that he is Hazan, delighting the Jews with his beautiful melodies. I like this one too, and there's a similarity, I think, to the last page I did, this uh, Hazan character, the Schleimel, the Hazan is slippery and obsequious and, you know, obviously hiding something or, you know, trying to manipulate the narrative. Uh, it's interesting the way Itzkovitz uh, deals with this, though, because he doesn't, you know, do the dialogue tags between him and his two, you know, saviors at the side of the road. Uh, you know, it's just that they explain what he said and, and you know, the tone that he would have said it in or, or, you know, the types of words that he would have used. So that it's not just reportage of what he said, but that he's being obsequious like, you know, that last guy, too. So uh, that's fun. Uh, I'm not sure if we follow him in the previous page 112, 112 pages or if we follow, you know, Fanny and Zizek. Uh, I'm not sure. I find out through reading the book and I'm definitely intrigued by this one. You know, it's an interesting setup of, you know, finding, you know, a dirty old man at the side of the road and who is he? And, you know, his story's a little weird and uh, he's hiding something. So, you know, intrigue abounds. A baby will brighten things, Reina. Maybe it's your destiny. Fuck destiny, I said, and he warned me not to tempt bad fortune by talking that way. Till he got locked up, Carlito was a church-going guy. First with Mommy, even when I refused to go with them. Then with Isabella and her daughter. They'd sit side by side in the front of the church, the perfect little family. Don't you ever want to be a mom? Carlito asked me that day. Not by some Puevon who won't even talk to me now. When it was over, he drove me home and helped me into bed. I slept for two days. ¿Y a esa que le pasa? Mama asked. Carlito lied, telling her I'd eaten some rotten bistec, and just to mix me some caldo to settle my stomach. With Nesto in front of me, talking about his family, I consider for a moment all the times I might have created a family of my own, where I would be now if I let that happen. The only certain thing is that I wouldn't be here now, on this island, with him. Why did you leave them to come here? I ask. Your children, I mean. I didn't leave them. I just took the first step so I can throw out the rope and they can come behind me. So I like parts of this. Uh, you know, this is something that invites conjecture. It really seems to me like there's an abortion happening between the lines. We're talking about uh, wanting to be a mother and not being a mother and the main uh, the protagonist or the first person person is uh, sick and we're lying about why. 
So that's certainly what I'm thinking about, is that, uh, you know, this is about uh, getting an abortion, but I might be, you know, going too far with that, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's a little confusing, you know, there's some, you know, uh, pronouns and things that don't always match up, and so, like, maybe I'd understand more if I knew the rest of the story, but sometimes it got a little confusing, but for the most part it seems to be a conversation between the protagonist and this man, Carlito, who it seems like she might be in a relationship with, uh, uh, illicit perhaps, because he's left his children to be with her. Although I really like that last line about going forth and first and then throwing back a rope. Like, you know, it's a way to still want to be involved in your kids' lives, I guess. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Okay, I am back with uh, another stab at some sound effects to bring us back to the present day. <laughs> And to recap, my December pick was The Space Between the Stars by Anne Corlett. My January pick was The Slaughterman's Daughter by Yaniv Itzkovitz. And my February pick was The Veins of the Ocean by Patricia Engel. And I'm going to go with The Space Between the Stars by Anne Corlett for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being the one that technically this game is about, being compelled by what was on the page. Uh, I like that whole idea of the conversation between two people and uh, talking about, you know, idealism and who we are as people and uh, what we believe, which does... Uh, feed a little bit into what I understood about this book uh, being speculative fiction, but about uh, taking a future event to try to uh, find humanity when humanity uh, is uh, more disparate than it is now. This uh, book uh, was marketed to me as having uh, major Station Eleven vibes, and it's also by the friend of a booktuber. Uh, by the friend, of, Anne Corlett is uh, the friend of uh, Katie from Books and Things. I believe they took uh, writing classes together, so that also was uh, what brought this book to my attention, and I am very excited to get to it. Granted, I have additional reasoning for not wanting to get to The Slaughterman's Daughter by Yaniv Itzkovitz right now, even though I am very excited to read this book as well. But uh, I did go ahead and decide that I wanted to make it the fiction pick for the Maybe Midrash Readathon, which I will be partaking in in May. So even though I went ahead and uh, chose it because it was my runner-up uh, in January, I did already slate it for something else. So. And so that just leaves uh, The Veins of the Ocean by uh, Patricia Engel, which, in fact, I have uh, hold on to this page 112 tag project four times now. <laughs> if you go back to some of my earlier videos, you'll uh, see me reading and discussing this page uh, three additional times. And I suppose uh, one might think, uh, after deciding for the fourth time not to go ahead with this book, why do I still have it around? Why am I not unhauling it? But uh, that's not really the way I want to go. I'm still interested in this page. I'm interested in what I know about this story. And I also tend to not unhaul books very often without at least giving them a try. Uh, so, uh... Well, one of my justifications then for not going through with this for the fourth time right now is uh, the fact that uh, this is getting kind of near the uh, top of my Goodreads TBR. Um, if I meet my uh, 2022 uh, resolution to clear all the books that are currently at the top of my Goodreads TBR, uh, then this one will be very near the top in 2023 in the range where I'll probably want to go ahead and pick it up and uh, read it then. So expect to see this book <laughs> sometime in the future. <laughs> uh, I even have a little bit of a date to give you for that. <laughs> oh, and another reason uh, that I've decided to add this book to my TBR for March uh, is because, in fact, uh, I'm playing another TBR game this month, the Booktube Spin, which is uh, uh, was brought to book two by Rick McDonnell, wherein uh, participants um, make up a list of 20 books that they want to get to, and then he does a little spinny thing on a wheel, and we have to pick the read the book that he lands on. And the book that I will be reading uh, for that uh, is another space opera book, uh, Tomorrow's Kin by Nancy Kress. Uh, technically, this book is about humans going out to space, and that book is about aliens coming to us, but... Uh, it's a similar uh, concept, obviously, so I'm excited to have some spacey sci-fi books on my TBR this month. 
along too with the, the Expanse books, which I'm slowly reading through as well. So I definitely have spacey sci-fi covered now. So that about covers it for me now. Uh, you can find the Goodreads links for all three of these books listed down below, as well as my uh, playlist for TBR games that I've played on this channel in the past. Another thing I like to do in these outros is highlight other TBR games or readathons because I like to think of myself in that tradition and to, you know, shout out other booktubers and what's going on there. Uh, so uh, this month I've decided to uh, shout out uh, the March of the Mammoths the readathon, uh, which is uh, put out by Lukash of, uh, I think his channel name right now is A Cruel Reader's Thesis. Uh, also, Jason from Old Blues Chapters and Verse, and Al from Big Al Books. Uh, it's been going a few years strong now. Uh, it is a uh, readathon that challenges you to read a book that is over 800 pages long. And in fact, I mentioned this uh, readathon in my latest book haul because I will de facto be taking part in this as well uh, because I have a book two prize book uh, that I have to read that fits that bill. So. <laughs> I'm very excited by all of my geeky reading challenges this month. <laughs> anyway, I will link to some announcement videos for the March of the Mammoths 2022 down below. And with that, I think I've said all I need to say here, except uh, for stay tuned. Uh, you'll see me later this week uh, for my latest uh, Am Reading video, hopefully on Friday. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.